minutes or um, you know we could probably get started um I think we had a few more people register so hopefully they'll kind of trickle in but probably in the interest of time get started um just so we don't end up running late if people have somewhere to be at um at noon so um you know good morning everyone thanks for joining us my name is Amelia Nichols and I'm representing the NDSU Department of Public Health Seminar Series today. Um, I have the honor of introducing the American Indian Public Health Resource Center, who will be presenting the American Indian Public Health Resource Center, a decade of tribal health collaboration. Uh, the month of November was chosen for this particular presentation as it is Native American Heritage Month. Uh, in introduction to our speakers, the American Indian Public Health Resource Center addresses American Indian public health disparities through technical assistance, policy, education, research, and programming in partnership with tribes in North Dakota, across the Northern Plains and the nation. Uh, if there's time, the uh, American Indian Public Health Resource Center will answer questions. After the webinar, please type your questions during the presentation into the chat uh, of the Zoom platform. And we'll be recording this session and it'll be available on the NDSU College of Health and Human Sciences YouTube page following the event. Um, so I will go ahead and turn it over to our speakers today. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Vanessa Tibbetts. I am an enrolled member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe, originally from South Dakota and the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And I will go ahead and let my team introduce themselves as well. Uh, Gretchen? Good morning, everyone. My name is Gretchen Dobrovich. I am the policy project manager at the American Indian Public Health Resource Center. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is, or actually, good morning. Uh, my name is Ryan Eagle. I am an enrolled member of the Mandan Hidats and the Rikara Nation, and I am the research project manager at the American Indian Public Health Resource Center. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sydney Shad. I am Minnie Kojuhun Flapo Lakota and I am the operations manager for the center. And we have another team member who is having a problem joining because it says they can't register as a host. And that is McKaylin Belgard. He is uh, a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa and he serves as our program leader, our program coordinator, I apologize, uh, for our center. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, all of the, the great accomplishments that our center has done uh, since our inception in uh, 2014. We are now on our 10 years uh, being a part of the American Indian Public Health Resource Center. Dr. Donald Warren was is the founder of our center. He is an American Indian doctor and master's of public health PhD. Um, he really saw a disconnect when it came to looking at uh, public health policy, research and education. And so he developed our center to really try to bring those, uh, those things together to really help address American Indian health disparities. Vanessa, your slides aren't advancing. What? Okay. Are we able to click slideshow? I thought I was on slideshow. It's so you, what we slide just, do you see? We just see the NDUS BPOS SharePoint address bar at the top. That is weird. McKaylin, would you like to share the slides? Because he's the one that. Yeah, one second. Sorry. For some reason, it wasn't letting me log into the Zoom. It said hosts cannot register. <laughs> OK, let's see. Uh, present. OK. How's that? Great. Can you move on to the next slide, please? There we go. Yes. This is Dr. Donald Warren. He was the founder of our center. 
And again, um, our center was to really focus on American Indian public health disparities and work on public health capacity building initiatives uh, for tribal nations in our region. Next slide, please. So this is our team. We just introduced ourselves and McKaylin was able to join us, thankfully. Um, again, I'm the program leader. Ryan is our public health research project manager that focuses on research initiatives within our center. Gretchen is our policy project manager and she focuses on uh, policy research, uh, drafting tribal resolutions, uh, really working with tribes to um, collaborate with uh, our legislators. And uh, she also assists with the public health 93638 process, which allows tribes to take over their healthcare uh, services from the federal government. McKaylin Belgard is our program coordinator and he helps us wherever we need it and very thankful for him. And Sydney is our um, operations manager. So she's like our behind the scenes person that makes sure that everything gets done in a timely manner and she keeps us on track. Um, next slide. Um, so again, the four areas of focus of our center, we operate on a four pronged approach when we work with our tribal nations and we focus on research, education, policy and public health services. Uh, with research, we collaborate with tribal leaders to identify research priorities, establish research agendas that will benefit the tribal communities and we assist tribes with developing their own research review boards, uh, community health assessments, and we also conduct indigenous evaluation research. Uh, our policy projects are uh, in, in partnership with tribal nations to identify policy and resolution analysis. Uh, we do policy research and development and develop advocacy and strategy goals. And we also provide, like I mentioned, a technical assistance to tribal nations to focus on 638 feasibility uh, and processes. And with education, we are all about spreading the word of public health and building our indigenous public health workforce. Uh, we engage tribal colleges and universities to develop public health curriculum at the undergraduate level based on tribal communities, public health needs. We work with tribal communities in North Dakota to provide outreach, engagement, and research training um, in our tribe's desired capacities. We recently uh, developed a public health 101 in Indian country in collaboration with the Great Plains Tribal Leaders Health Board, which is uh, really a beneficial uh, training to educate emerging tribal leaders on um, public health and public health impacts on tribal nations. Uh, we also host an indigenous public health leaders training program that focuses on training emerging indigenous public health leaders uh, in uh, education. And that is a really great project in our education focus area. Uh, with services, we work with tribes to strengthen public health services and programs based on our tribal priorities. All of the work that we do is in collaboration with tribal nations based on their needs. We never try to push a agenda or a research project or grant that the tribes do not wanna focus on. Again, we could conduct community health assessments, we work with tribal nations and their organizations in strategic planning to really help them uh, focus on the work that they do to help uh, assist in their strategic initiatives. Um, we also improve tribal public health services by identifying priorities, locating resources and planning for sustainability.
The goal of the American Indian Public Health Resource Center is to improve indigenous health systems, increase access to services, and improve indigenous health outcomes by providing technical assistance that includes public health services, programming, research, education, and policy, like Vanessa just said. Um, some of the various technical assistance services we provide include cultural capacity building, assessing service and program priorities, assessing tribal priorities related to health disparities, conducting community health assessments, strategic planning, grant writing, developing public health resources and programs, developing public health education programs and curriculum, helping tribes establish their research agendas, developing tribally driven policies, 638 feasibility assessments, um, and facilitation. Next slide, please. Oh, and 82, 82, uh, the significance of 82 on this slide is the 82 uh, unique tribal and urban communities we have served over the last 10 years. Next slide, please. So this slide identifies some of the various and diverse partners and stakeholders we have worked with over the past 10 years. Um, it's obviously not comprehensive, but gives you an idea of sort of the um, how unique and diverse some of them are from Atomic Coffee here in Fargo to uh, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe to Guam, Seventh-day Adventist. Next slide, please. Um, our indigenous people uh, and communities already have the solutions to their public health issues. They don't need to be educated or told what to do by the government or for, by anyone else for that matter. We build relationships and we meet each unique Indigenous community where they're at to ensure their voices are heard, to help implement their own solutions. Um, there are no cookie cutter solutions or one size fits all approaches to working in Indian country when it comes to public health or anything for that matter. Um, this slide includes a visual representation of the diverse Indigenous communities we have worked with across the nation. Um, again, including the Seventh-day Adventist Clinic in Guam, way out there in the Western Pacific Ocean. Next slide, please. Uh, the center recognizes that each community is gonna have their own cultural context. So we like to make sure that we are aware of their history, uh, their kinship ties, the culture and their traditions and values so that we can respect um, their way of life and what their community practices in terms of tradition. Uh, we also understand that without trust, we will we would not be able to sustain the relationships in our tribal communities. And then having generosity, that's one of our teachings within our culture, knowing that like uh, to give means something uh, more beyond uh, money or anything like that and recognizing that gifting is something that's a core value within multiple tribal communities. Uh, communication, uh, recognizing that different tribal communities will have different communication styles, but also making sure that we're communicating effectively within each tribal nation. To share a little bit about the Indigenous Public Health Leaders Program, it is a six month long training institute that we partnered with the National Networks of Public Health Institutes and Seven Directions. We were funded by the CDC. And through that program, we held multiple uh, virtual sessions on things like the social determinants of health, um, emergency planning, um, COVID preparation, mitigation, vaccination strategies, so on and so forth. And then our first cohort, we had one in-person gathering and the second cohort, we were actually able to do multiple in-person gatherings. We did a regional cohort gathering and then um, one big group gathering. And we've had such great success and really positive feedback in our ability to convey the importance of networking, um, professional development, and then overall competence of tribal public health. One of the initiatives that the American Indian Public Health Resource Center has worked on in collaboration with tribal nations and, and tribal serving 
um, organizations has been improving quality of health outcomes for uh, native maternal, native moms, infants, and children. Children, um, some of the work that we're currently doing is we've received funding from HRSA to do rural health care services outreach. Um, and we've developed a consortium of, of professionals working in tribal communities and tribal serving organizations who focus on maternal infant and child health issues. Another um, thing that we've been doing, and it's actually I believe our ninth year, is the Tribal Maternal Infant and Child Health Symposium, which brings um, professionals working in the area of maternal infant and child health um, in tribal communities together. And um, we have presenters who um, talk about timely topics as well as exploring how to apply that information to improving health outcomes. As far as our IMAHAC um, project, it's expanding access to maternal and infant health services in rural North Dakota tribal communities. Um, and as um, Ryan had talked about earlier, solutions are in communities. Most often it's an issue of resource availability. And so this project engages tribal communities in developing culturally responsive community-based models for delivering that care. Um, and also builds their capacity to sustain um, the improvements in maternal and infant health outcomes. Next slide, please. Policy, ad policy and advocacy are another piece of the work that we do. And uh, one of the unique things that we offer at the American Indian Public Health Resource Center is 638 feasibility studies. We developed a toolkit for tribal nations to use to work through doing these feasibility studies. Um, 638 is a federal law which grants tribal nations the ability to operate and manage their education, um, health care, law enforcement, and other services. And the feasibility study is the is the first point. It's helpful in identifying what the community strengths are in moving forward and areas um, where there are gaps that will need to be met. Another project um, that we worked on with policy advocacy is the high obesity program. Um, NDSU received a grant, NDSU extension received a grant through the CDC um, to address high obesity rates in two tribal communities in North Dakota. And the center um, developed a policy matrix of all of the um, policies impacting American um, in obesity in American Indians. Another uh, project we worked on related to policy is um, the Wallapai tribe, which is one of the tribes of the Grand Canyon on the northern side contracted with us to provide them policy resources to develop a campaign for long term care. We also worked with tribal nations in North Dakota on their request. Um, to develop uh, community health workers in North Dakota, which would provide a funding pathway for community health representatives who are the community health workers in tribal nations. That program is funded through IHS. Um, and also we were called upon during the COVID pandemic um, by uh, the state of North Dakota and tribes um, placed in North Dakota, as well as in other communities to help develop um, policies and protocols around um, COVID. Uh, next slide, please. This is just an example of how powerful um, Public Law 93638 is, which gives tribes that authority to um, contract with the federal government to manage and operate their services. Um, this is an, an, an education example. Um, the school that you, the school building that you see on the left um, was a school building in one of the tribal nations placed in North Dakota before that tribal nation took over the management and um, operation of its public school system. On the right, you'll see the school building um, 
after the tribal nation took over the operation and management of their school. Um, I believe that um, 638 contracting is one of the uh, most important tools for autonomy for tribal nation. And um, it's, it's certainly one of the pieces of work that we um, put a tremendous amount of focus on. Next slide. Um, we also collaborate closely with our uh, state departments of health and human services. Uh, in 2016, we collaborated with the Minnesota Department of Health to facilitate the Minnesota Tribal State Opioid Summit. And at this summit, we were really looking at addressing prescription drug monitoring practices and really did action planning with the Minnesota Tribal Nations to identify what could be done about prescription monitoring, identify actionable items of what could be done, uh, identify and address policy and budget rep recommendations for the state of Minnesota, look at what Minnesota tribes could do to address this, identify what the group is committed to with our Minnesota tribal nations, and then identify a next course of action. And through this uh, facilitation, there were two recommendations that went to the state, and that was to improve opioid prescribing behaviors and also to establish a prescri prescription drug monitoring program. Community health assessments are a large piece of the work that we do. Currently, we are working with two tribal nations placed in North Dakota um, to do comprehensive community health assessments. And um, health assessments are a review of processes and health concerns in communities um, to help identify what the key health issues that resources and efforts should be targeted at. Um, our process for con facilitating community health assessments is uh, tribally driven and culturally responsive. We work with tribes to develop a plan to address their community needs, often called a community health improvement plan, after a community health assessment has been completed. On the left of this slide, you'll see the process that we use. Uh, several years ago, we received funding through the North Dakota Department of Health to develop a toolkit um, specialized for tribal nations to uh, provide community health assessments. And that toolkit is available on our website. And um, this slide is taken from that, um, that toolkit. Next slide. This slide represents another collaboration we wanted to highlight. In 2016, the Minnesota Department of Health partnered with us and 10 of the tribal, 10 of the 11 tribal nations in Minnesota to evaluate the Tribal Statewide Health Improvement Partnership, also known as Tribal SHIP, and the Tribal Tobacco Grant programs of each of the 10 tribes. These programs sought to address lack of regular physical activity and use of commercial and or traditional tobacco in the communities, in the schools, at work sites, and at healthcare settings through a policy systems and environmental approach. We partnered with each tribal nation to conduct a culturally responsive evaluation of their tribal ship and tribal tobacco programs to determine the impacts these programs had on the communities. Um, our team utilized the American Indian Higher Education Consortium's Indigenous Evaluation Framework and created a process to implement the framework and evaluate the tribal ship and tribal programs for each tribe. We recently published this experience in the Canadian Journal of Program Evaluation in the June and July 2023 edition, if anyone is interested in learning more. Next slide, please. Okay, so this initiative was done in collaboration with United Tribes Technical College um, Health and Wellness Program. So we actually traveled to United Tribes after um, some strategic planning and conducted a enrollment campaign where we were able to enroll 59 uh, United Tribes students in Medicaid. 
Um, they applied for single and family coverage. The process took about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, we were able to use a whole computer room and there was about eight trained navigators uh, helping out. And we were able to also give uh, incentives for those who did apply. They were able to uh, enter themselves into a drawing and win things like TVs, crockpots, and it was a really good turnout. And we would like to do this, something similar again. Another um, technical assistance service that we provide is strategic planning. Um, like I'd mentioned earlier, it's really important to help um, tribes and tribal serving organizations establish a vision, develop strategies, set goals, monitor the work that they're doing and review their strategies and goals to see if they were attainable. And if they weren't, why not? Um, so we love working with tribal communities and tribal serving organizations on doing strategic planning. Uh, we've worked with the Arizona Health Zone. Um, one of our MPH graduates, Marlinda Holly, is, uh, works at the Arizona Health Zone, and she contacted us to do strategic planning training with some of the people who she works with in the food stamp and food distribution programs so that they could better um, learn how to set goals and plans with tribal nations. Uh, we work closely with MHA Nation. We have a great working relationship with them. And we have done uh, strategic planning for their Child Safety Center and their Circle of Life Substance Use Disorder Program. Uh, we also work with the Tonkawa Tribe of Oklahoma to do strategic planning for their health services uh, with White Earth Nation to do uh, strategic planning for their harm reduction summit. Uh, we also host the North Dakota and facilitate the North Dakota tribal health directors meetings. And through that, we've conducted strategic planning with the North Dakota tribal health directors to establish a five-year plan for what they would like to see uh, as health directors collaborating with the states on, uh, on initiatives. We also did similar strategic planning with the Minnesota Tribal Health Directors. And we love working with local and community organizations. Uh, we've conducted strategic planning for the Fargo-Moorhead Indigenous Association. Um, we collaborated with Messengers for Health to do strategic planning, and they're located at Crow Nation. Uh, we did uh, strategic planning with Leech Lake for their tribal opioid response program, and also went all the way to California and collaborated with the Lake County Tribal Health Diabetes Program to do strategic planning. Cool. And these are some of the collaborations that we have had within programs at NDSU. So the Summer Undergraduate Research Program is a two-week program that took place to engage tribal college students in pursuing their research and careers uh, in public health and in research in general at NDSU, sort of like a bridge program. Um, CDC High Obesity Program, uh, this is in partnership with, uh, it would be with Ramona Danielson and Jacob Davis, uh, aiming to address health disparities related to poor nutrition, physical inactivity or obesity within tribal nations. Uh, the Grandmother's Gift of Life Garden is something that we hold sacred to us. It's like a safe space on campus to practice our culture. Um, there's also the four medicines that are in the garden. Um, they're actually creating a new garden uh, that's under construction right now. I'm not quite sure of the location specifically. I think Gretchen can mention that. Um, and then working in Native Directions is an initiative to raise awareness uh, of all of the collaborations across NDSU that involve tribal communities, uh, providing a space for individuals leading these initiatives to collaborate and build uh, more partnerships. And through Surrey, uh, housed right in our public health program, the Center for Immunization Research and Education, uh, in collaboration with them, we have been working to increase vaccine rates in tribal communities um, through multiple vaccine initiatives.
And then Gretchen, do you, or Vanessa, do you know the location for the new Mother's Earth Garden? Grandmother Earth's uh, Gift of Life Garden um, is go is in the process of being uh, moved and reinvigorated on the southwest corner of campus where um, there are uh, public gardens right now and um, there's also the where the Lily Garden collection is. Cool, cool. I'm a little directionally challenged. <laughs> Thank you. And McKaylin was also a student in our summer undergraduate research program out when he was in his undergrad. Yeah, that's actually a picture of me when I was 18 in the American Fighter t-shirt up in the right corner. <laughs> As with any work within public health, there are always barriers. And uh, these are a few of the barriers that the American Indian Public Health Resource Center and the tribal nations um, that we have served encounter in doing public health work. Uh, one of the uh, barriers that we encounter at the American Indian Public Health Resource Center is limited institutional support. Our organization was designed to be self-sufficient. Um, we work on soft money through grants and contracts. Um, so we are always hustling. Um, we are in essence then a standalone within a system. And oftentimes it's like trying to shove a square peg into a circle um, for all of the systems to work together. One of the other barriers that we encounter in this work is a lack of culturally responsive institutional policies, whether those are um, governmental on a federal, state, local level, whether they're within systems of care. Um, a, a good example of this, and McKaylin had talked about this earlier when he was talking about um, our organization's values and generosity and gifting um, is very important in indigenous cultures. Um, oftentimes that does not fit into um, fun, allowable funding. Another one is food. A lot of work is conducted um, around a meal. And um, oftentimes there is not funding that exists to be able to cover that piece, that cultural piece that um, is important because that's the way that work is done. We sit down together, um, share a meal and share ideas and develop plans. Another barrier has been grants and foundation funding priorities. With the COVID pandemic, a lot of funding, uh, a lot of funders shifted their funding priorities to address the pandemic, which was absolutely needed. Um, since that time, the way that many um, foundations and funding sources um, have prioritized the work that they fund has become very narrow, and there has been um, even less funding that has been available, which has increased competition amongst uh, tribal nations and tribal serving organizations such as ourselves. Racism, myths, and stigmatization um, continue to be barriers for the work that we do. And racism, not, not always overt racism, but also covert, in, covert racism, um, institutional racism, racism um, barriers uh, within systems that keep native and indigenous people from being able to access services or to move forward. Um, an example that I like to use from the policy world is, is that Indian Health Services um, is thought to be so a myth that Indians have free health care. If you're Native American, you have free health care. The reality is, is, is that Indian Health Services is not available everywhere, and it is only funded at 60% of what its actual operating need is. Uh, the Indian Health Services is what's considered discretionary funding, meaning that when Congress creates budgets, they aren't required to fund it at a certain level. So the amount of funding goes up and down 
for those services. Um, Na Native Americans living in the upper Great Plains have some of the worst health outcomes of any persons living in the United States. And one of the stigmas around that is, is that Native people um, don't take care of themselves. They have high levels of alcoholism and, and drug misuse. They um, don't access care when they get, quote, free health care, when in reality, Native Americans as, as a racial group in the United States have the highest number of individuals who do not drink any alcohol at all, higher than all other racial groups. Also, people don't access health care because health care is not accessible. Um, either funding runs out before the fiscal year is done, and so there are no services that are available. Um, People have to travel very long distances to get to a clinic to provide those services, and a specialist they may need might not be available. For example, right now, there's only one tribal nation placed in North Dakota that has a physician that um, does obstetrics and delivery. Um, so that is not an that is not healthcare that's available to you if you live in those communities. And so a great piece of our work is addressing um, the covert and overt racism, particularly institutional racism, dispelling myths, um, and removing stigmatization of healthcare for Native people. Um, tribal member mistrust due to broken treaties and unethical research. For half a century, the federal government, as well as private entities and state government um, have broken legally binding agreements. The United States federal government has well over a thousand treaties with tribal nations um, across what is now the United States. Not one of those treaties has not been broken by the federal government. There's a long history of unethical research and uh, medical um, medical malpractice that has been perpetrated on Native people. And so Native people have mistrust with universities when it comes to research, um, government funding for services, and um, establishing relationships with the nations that we work with um, prior to just coming in and doing anything and also making sure that we are always working um, at the direction of the tribe and not the direction of um, what we believe or what a funder believes um, things should happen is one of the ways that we address that barrier of mistrust. Um, limited access to tribal data. Um, I'm assuming that most of us that are at this presentation today work in public health and recognize the importance of good data. Tribal nations don't have access to um, a lot of their data. Um, IHS only can only collects data that is required for the reporting for the reports that go to Congress. So for additional data, it may not be collected at all. Um, a tribe may be working with uh, public health through a county or a state and they are not provided that data. And this really hinders the ability to address public health issues and improve health outcomes when tribal nations don't have access to data. Tribal leadership um, turnover is one of the other barriers. Um, the, the IRA, which um, if you're Irish, this is a very different IRA than what, what those of us that are Irish too, but the Indian Re Reorganization Act um, essentially set up tribal, what is modern day tribal governments. And they were designed in a way in which a new tribal leader and tribal um, council members are elected every two years. And so every two years, there can be this turnover. Now, it isn't to say that people aren't reelected sometimes, but it can be a huge barrier. And the example that I like to use is um, a tribal nation we were who contracted with us to do a 638 feasibility study um, 
had tribal leadership turnover. So for a year and a half with um, over $100,000 worth of federal funding, um, this tribal nation was working on assessing um, moving from an IHS system of care to the tribe managing and operating its own care. The current tribal leadership was um, supportive of the tribe um, asserting that sovereignty. At the end of the project, right as it was being completed, there was a tribal election. There was a new tribal chair and every member of their tribal council turned over as well. And the new administration had no interest in moving forward um, with the tribe um, exerting its sovereignty and managing and operating its own healthcare system. So the tribal leadership turnover and the way the federal government has structured um, tribal, tribal governments um, is a huge barrier for those very, um, those, those very tribal nations. Um, I, the last barrier that, I'll, barrier that I'll talk about is limited tribal resources. Um, again, much of the funding um, that goes to tribal nations is federal. Um, and that is the result of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, treaties um, in which tribal nations um, provided the federal government with land and natural resources in exchange for services, including but not limited to healthcare, education, um, and some basic infrastructure um, needs. And operating Oper funding for operation um, of their tribal nations when natural resources were taken over by the federal government. Unfortunately, the federal government hasn't upheld their end of those agreements, and so it limits the resources that tribes have available to invest in into their public and clinical health. And when there are federal grants available or there are foundation grants available that tribal nations apply for it's competitive. And so there are winners and losers in that process, which creates further um, health inequities amongst tribal nations. So all of these barriers play a part in the health outcomes of Native American people and are all barriers that our team at the American Indian Public Health Resource Center um, works alongside tribal nations to mitigate as they work to improve their health outcomes. Next slide. So looking towards the future, we hope to continue our Indigenous Public Health Leaders Program. We're currently exploring other um, funding sources beyond um, some current options that are pretty restrictive in what can be spent and aren't always culturally responsive in instances like providing meals, in providing gifts for, you know, in exchange for their time and participating. Um, as well as our USDA Indigenous Food Sovereignty Summer Institute. This is a recent grant that we were awarded and we're in the early stages of planning. So not too specific as to what we um, will be doing, but what we hope to do is provide a pathway for Indigenous youth to pursue agricultural degree programs um, at state universities with the intent of returning home um, with the knowledge to build sustainable food programs in their own communities. Next slide. Uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Caring Foundation Spark Funding. Um, the purpose of this funding will be for our sewing circles in urban and tribal communities across North Dakota. Um, originally, the sewing circles were used for vaccination and immunization education and advocacy, but due to some um, circumstances out of our control, uh, we've had to seek outside other funding to keep these projects going as they've been really um, integral to um, building community within our tribal nations, a good spot for people to come together and share information. Um, so we're looking to broaden those and expand our topics of discussion. And then the Turtle Mountain Outreach Circles of Care program. Uh, this was a grant that the team actually helped uh, their program right and we will be doing the program evaluation uh, in collaboration with a community researcher that is uh, living and working in Turtle Mountain.
And that is all. Wonderful. Thank you for that presentation. And um, all the work that you've done over the last 10 years is just incredible to see. <laughs> um, I'm sure a, a one hour presentation doesn't really encompass all of it because it's been so much. So thank you for that. Um, if anyone has questions that they would like to put in the chat, please feel free to. If you're able to unmute, um, you're welcome to do that too, um, to ask any questions or, or comment. Hello, everyone, and special thank you to all of you at the Research Center for sharing uh, your work with us and for uh, all the hard work that you've been doing. And it is really uh, just amazing uh, to see how many um, different areas you've had an impact and how many different nations you've worked with. So uh, congratulations on 10 years, and just thank you for all the really important work you continue to do. I had heard recently that you were gonna be working, um, I think with the family sphere at home visiting model. And I apologize, I missed um, the earlier slides and I'm looking forward to reviewing the recording. But um, is that related to the circles of care program or is that another um, initiative? Or did I, did I get my wires crossed somewhere? <laughs> That will be with another initiative. Uh, we are working with uh, two tribal communities, uh, Standing Rock and Spirit Lake. To we're an affiliate site, so we will be uh, hosting the training, the Family Spirit training out of Johns Hopkins University with uh, those two tribal nations, so that they can uh, focus on more culturally responsive home visiting programs for their uh, young mothers and families. Really exciting. I did also want to mention that we have a great collaboration with Dr. Andrea Huseth within the Department of Public Health. Uh, we are working with her to do a, a menstruation study on adolescent female youth in tribal communities. And we're uh, really excited about uh, what that the outcomes of that project will be to possibly bring more resources to our tribal communities to address uh, menstruation with our with our female young girls. And if there's no more questions, we just want to say thank you all for taking the time to hear about our center and our stories. We'll be Latanka, Mazgadads, Miigwech, Pilamiyaye, and I don't know how to say the other one, so. <laughs> you too. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for your excellent presentation and everyone for attending today's event. Um, a recording will be available on the College of Health and Human Sciences YouTube page. Um, so you hope we hope that you'll join us for our next seminar presentation, which we kind of offer on a monthly basis here. So our next one is going to be on December 19th at noon. Um, it will be myself and Mae Williams, and we're going to be talking about um, some of the findings and research that um, the Center for Immunization Research and Education has been doing. Um, and then also what we are doing at APHA. Um, so the registration has been in the, put in the chat. Um, but again, thank you to the American Indian Public Health Resource Center. Um, that was an awesome presentation and I look forward to see what you guys do for the next 10 years. <laughs>